In this video, we want to talk about the fourth type of market that we're going to discuss, and that's oligopoly. And oligopoly means a few firms. So anything more than one firm, which would be a monopoly, would qualify as an oligopoly. Let's, just so that we know kind of where this all fits in, we've taken a look at this several times, but let's think about um, uh, perfect competition down here. That's the first one we studied. Perfect competition. Um, we talked about monopoly, situation where there's only one firm. So those are the two ends of the extreme. And then we've talked about monopolistic competition. That is basically perfect competition with differentiated goods. Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a market structure, oligopoly, that's closer to this end of the spectrum. So as soon as you're not a monopoly, as soon as there's more than one firm, it becomes an oligopoly. And then at some point, there's, it's not really a smooth continuum necessarily, but um, down here to this end, we've got monopolistic competition and perfect competition. For, for now, let's take a look at some of the things that we've seen in, in those different types of markets, and let's just kind of compare what we saw. We've seen that it, with perfect competition, price ends up being equal to marginal cost. The firms, perfectly competitive firms, charge you a price that's equal to their cost of production. We also saw that price gets driven to equal the minimum average total cost. And we talked about the fact that there is productive and consumption efficiency here. Deadweight loss is equal to zero with perfect competition. That's really the type of thing that we were thinking about, about back when we were talking about the efficiency of markets and the fact that a free market maximizes total surplus. We talked then about monopoly and with monopoly we saw that price is greater than marginal cost so a monopoly charges you a price that's greater than their cost of production we saw that price was not driven to equal the minimum average total cost now notice that what this means is that profit ends up being equal to zero for perfectly competitive firms for a monopoly as long as there's a strong demand for their product the profit that a monopoly earns can be positive in the long run. And we saw that there is deadweight loss. Deadweight loss is greater than zero. Then we talked about monopolistic competition. With monopolistic competition, we saw that price ends up being greater than marginal cost. So that's the same as what we saw with monopoly. We saw that price is driven to equal average total cost, but it's not the minimum average total cost. We saw that a, a monopolistically competitive firm actually produces with excess capacity. They do not produce at their efficient scale, but we saw that free entry drives um, profit to equal zero. So price is greater than marginal cost with a monopolistically competitive market, which is like monopoly, but profit gets driven to zero in a monopolistically competitive market, which is like competition. And then there's deadweight loss with this type of market. Deadweight loss is positive. But remember that since profit gets driven to zero, it's, it's really challenging to try to think about any type of regulation, any type of regulation on these types of firms that force them to choose something other than their profit maximizing price and quantity would cause their profit to be less than zero, they'd exit the market in the long run. So there's deadweight loss, but it's deadweight loss that we're just willing to live with. And the silver lining is that in this type of market, there's lots and lots of product variety and there are continually um, new advances in products and product quality oftentimes is increasing. And so there are some really good things that happen here that cause us to not worry too much about that deadweight loss. Now we're going to talk about oligopoly. And let me just tell you right off the bat that this discussion is going to be a little different than the discussions we've already had in the sense that it's really hard to draw a picture of what a monopoly looks like because every different monopoly is going to look a little different. And so we're not going to focus so much on pictures of cost curves and 
and profit maximization, although those firms will be doing that. Um, we're going to focus more on some game theory stuff and we're going to think about strategic interaction between firms. But we can say that with oligopoly, price is going to end up being greater than marginal cost. Oftentimes, it, it kind of depends on the type of oligopoly that we're talking about, but with oligopoly there will be barriers to entry and what we'll see is that there are times when oligopolies can make a positive profit in the long run and there's going to be deadweight loss that's greater than zero with an oligopoly. So you can see that an oligopoly looks in terms of the outcome for consumers and the outcome for society, it looks very similar to what we see with a monopoly. All these firms maximize profit by producing the quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. It's just that with oligopoly we, we take a little bit different approach when we think about um, kind of how to analyze the market. So let's think about the characteristics of oligopoly. So we've got oligopoly, the characteristics. The first one is that there are a few firms. So we're not going to define what we mean by few. It could be two, it could be five, more than one, and not nearly as many as there would be with perfect competition or monopolistic competition. There are a few firms and when you have a few firms, each firm's going to have a relatively big impact on the market. So in these types of markets, we would describe the firms as being small compared to the size of the market. With an oligopoly, we would describe the firms as being big compared to the size of the market. Each firm is going to have a big impact on the, the market. The second characteristic, and this one we can choose a, a lot of different ways to go with this one, but we're going to say little product differentiation. Little product differentiation. As a matter of fact, we're, we're going to think about the firms as selling identical products. We can have an, an oligopoly where the firms sell identical products. We could have an oligopoly where the firms um, sell differentiated products and each different type of oligopoly is going to act a little bit different. It's going to behave a little bit different. So for what we're doing, let's just kind of assume that the goods are identical. If they're not identical, they're really close. There's very little product differentiation. So let's, let's just say here, we'll say almost identical. And then the final characteristic is that there are barriers to entry. They will not be strict barriers to entry. There can be oligopolies where there can be some entry, but there's going to be a barrier. So for example, a barrier to entry that would not be a strict barrier to entry would be, say, um, uh, the market that I'm in. So. Um, to be a professor, you've got to have a terminal degree. You need to have a, a PhD and, and it doesn't matter if any of my students could teach economics better than me. I don't have to compete against them, not at this moment, because they don't have the degree. They could go get it. It would take a few years and some effort, but you could get the degree and then you could come and, and compete against me and my job. But there's a barrier to entry in, in that particular job. The medical industry, um, any type of licensing, um, those all would be examples of barriers to entry, but they're not strict barriers to entry. So let's think about some examples of oligopolies. So there are lots of them. Soft drink industry, characterized by basically two big companies, Coke and Pepsi. There are some other smaller companies, but uh, the a vast majority of the market belongs to two companies. Um, we could think about airlines. We could think about cell phone service. Or we could think about something like a satellite radio or satellite television. Um, we could think about um, the, the car industry, automotives. Um, we could think about the crude oil industry. That's a, an oligopoly. The gasoline industry isn't. That's close to a perfectly competitive market. 
but the crude oil industry is an oligopoly. Um, so you can see there are several examples. Um, I would say that oligopoly is probably the second most common type of market. Monopolistically competitive markets, most common, very common. Oligopoly, there's a good amount of that. Perfect competition, not very much. Monopoly, not very much. I would say monopoly is probably the, the rarest form of market that we're thinking about. Kind of depends on how we define the market. If we were thinking about, let's say, the market for gasoline in a big city, the market for gasoline is perfectly competitive. But if we were talking about a smaller town that only had two or three gas stations, at least the gas market within that town would act like an oligopoly. And if we had a small town with only one gas station, well, it would act a little bit like a monopoly. But people can drive to other towns to buy gas. So it, it kind of depends on how we define the market. So those are some examples of oligopoly. The key thing about oligopoly that's different from any of the other types of markets that we're going to think about is we're going to think about strategic interaction. We're going to think a lot about strategic interaction between the firms. That is not something that we thought about with any of the other types of markets. So with perfect competition, the firms don't care what the other firms are doing. Right, if you're a gas station owner um, and uh, you're trying to decide how to, to um, figure out what price to charge or what quantity to produce, you don't have any control over the price. You respond based upon what the market does to the price. Now, the incentives that you face are going to cause you to push your price in a particular direction or the other, depending upon what the market is doing. But you don't care what the other gas stations are doing because the only thing that puts dollars in your pocket is what happens at your pumps. Okay, so there's no strategic interaction that's happening with perfect competition. The, the rule for a perfectly competitive firm, produce the quantity where price equals marginal cost. There's no strategic interaction for a monopoly, and it's trivial because there's no other firms with a monopoly. So the monopolist doesn't have to worry about other firms. With monopolistic competition, there's no strategic interaction. The firms are all small compared to the size of the market. They may have an incentive to try to market themselves, to try to increase the residual demand curve that they face, but that's not what we're talking about here. Okay? It's not until we get to oligopoly where the firms have to think about what the other firms are doing. And the reason they have to think about what the other firms are doing is that the decision of any one other firm is going to have a big impact on the market. These firms are large compared to the size of the market, and so they have to think really carefully about what the other firms are doing. That makes their decision much more challenging. So here's the, the thing that makes running an oligopoly difficult. The thing that makes it difficult is you don't know what demand curve you face. These firms all do. They know what the demand curve that they face looks like. But an oligopolist doesn't. It depends on what the other firms do. So they have to try to decide what the other firms are going to do before they can figure out what they're going to do. Okay, so the decisions of any one firm have a big impact on the market. Let's just say that in an oligopoly, the firms are large compared to the size of the market. let's just say, to the market. And that's very different from any of the other three types of markets that we've thought about. What that results in is they face uncertainty about the demand curve they face. They are uncertain about the demand curve they face. That makes it really challenging. Now, in order to understand that, that may not make perfect sense to you, but in order to understand that, we need to go through an exa a few examples. And once you start to see what's going on here, I think you'll understand why they're not sure what kind of demand curve they face. When we have a situation like this where we need to study the strategic interaction between two people or between two firms or between people and a firm, we use what's referred to as game theory. 
So in game theory, game theory is just kind of a sub-discipline within the field of economics and game theory is just the study of strategic interaction. Um, within game theory, the way we're going to analyze things, we're going to have a game. So the strategic interaction we will refer to as a game, although it doesn't have to be a fun game. So if, um, let's suppose you and I are standing facing each other and you've got a gun to my forehead and I've got a gun to your forehead. Well, that we would describe as a game, not a fun game. The decision I make depends on what I think you're going to do, right? So think about that situation. If, if I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt you were going to pull the trigger, then it's in my best interest to pull the trigger first. On the other hand, if I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that you weren't going to pull the trigger, then it's in my best interest to not pull the trigger because if I know you're not going to, and I do, that's murder. And you face the same set of incentives. Now, neither of us know exactly what the other person are going to do, so that's a, a strategic interaction. And we're going to have to, in a split second, make a decision about what we think the other person's going to do. And we could be right, we could be wrong we would describe that as a game. Clearly not a fun situation to be in. The people who are involved in the game we would call the players. The options that the players have we would call the strategies. And then there's going to be some outcome of the strategy and we would call those the payoffs. So the payoff could be a good thing it could be a bad thing. Okay. So in game theory, it's the study of strategic interaction using games, players, the players are going to have strategies, they're going to choose their strategy, each player is going to choose their strategy and then we get to observe the outcome and each player is going to get whatever payoff corresponds to that outcome. So now let's kind of start to illustrate the, the strategic interaction between firms with a kind of a simple um, market type example where we've got a couple of firms and let's suppose that these two firms are selling water. Okay, so suppose we have what we're going to call a duopoly. A duopoly is two firms. Each of these firms is going to be selling water And just to make things simple, we're going to assume, assume that their marginal cost of production is zero. We don't have to do that, but that makes this example simple. And we want it to be a simple example because we want to focus on the strategic interaction, not so much the cost stuff. So we'll talk here in a little bit about what happens if we make the marginal cost something other than zero. So quite literally, what the way this is going to work is that we have two firms in the morning, each firm has to decide how much water they want to pump out of the ground and take to town. And the pumping of the water and the taking it to town cost them nothing. Okay? Once they get to town, they're going to sell their water and they can't bring more water once they've gotten to town. Now here's the problem for the firm. The price of water when they get into town depends upon how much water I bring as a firm and let's suppose you're the other firm, the price of water is going to depend on how much water each of us brings. So if I know you're going to bring a lot of water, then I know the supply of water is going to be high that day and the price is going to be low and I might not want to bring very much water if I know you're going to bring a lot. On the other hand, if I know you're not going to bring very much, I might want to bring a lot because I know by you not bringing very much, all other things equal, that's going to cause the price to be higher. So how much water I bring depends on how much water I think you're going to bring. And you face the same dilemma. You don't know how much I'm going to bring. Once we get there, we'll find out how much we've both brought. But by then it's too late to change what we did. Okay? So that's the situation. Every day the two firms bring water to town and they sell it to the people in town. Let's pretend as if the people in town don't have any other alternative source of water. They have to buy it from one of the two firms. Now let's think about what the town's demand schedule looks like. So let's put over here 
quantity and let's make our quantity go from zero up to 120 by tens. So we're going to go zero, 10, 20, up to 120. So there's our quantity. Now let's think about the price and what we're doing here is we're just tracing out a downward sloping demand curve. I want this to be a very simple downward sloping demand curve so I'm going to start it at 120. I'm going to go down by 10 each time down to zero. So if we do that it's going to look like this. So there's a downward sloping demand curve. Um, if we were to draw that, let me draw it right down in here. If we were to draw that demand curve, price up here, quantity down here, at a price of 120, quantity zero, so right up here is 120, and then it goes down by 10 each time and over by 10 each time, so the slope is negative one, so down here, by the time we get to a price of zero, quantity is 120. So here's what that demand curve looks like. Okay? It's just a basic demand curve. It's downward sloping like any other demand curve we've worked with. So there's the uh, town's demand schedule. Let's figure out what total revenue looks like. Total revenue. Now let's think about this assumption that we've made. By making it costless to produce water, we are making total revenue equal to profit. Okay? We don't have to do that, but it just is more complicated if we don't do this. So that's why we're making this assumption. So all we have to do is take our price times our quantity and that gives us our total revenue, which will be profit. Well, if they don't sell any water, because the price is 120, then they make total revenue. The rest of these look like this. Here's what profit looks like. So now let's think about what would happen under a couple of different circumstances. We've set this up as if it's two firms. We're both going to decide how much water we bring and then once we get to the market we'll figure out what the price is and then we'll know what our profit is. So, look, for example, let's suppose you bring 30 gallons and I bring 30 gallons. Well, if you bring 30 and I bring 30, then the total quantity that day is going to be 60. It's going to result in a price of 60 and our, the total profit is going to be 3,600. Each of us is going to get half of that profit, which is 1,800. And the way that we're figuring that out is if we both bring 30, then the total quantity is going to be 60. The supply curve that day is perfectly inelastic because the quantity of water is whatever we brought that day. So there's the supply curve. If we look at a quantity of 60 in that supply curve, it tells us the price is 60. So that's all we're doing. If, on the other hand, let's suppose that you brought 40 and I brought 40. Well, if you bring 40 and I bring 40, the, the total quantity is going to be 80 the supply curve would be shifted to the right in that case. The total quantity is 80 and so it's going to drive price down to 40. So that's how we figure out what the price is going to be and what our profit's going to be. If we both bring 40 and it drives the price down to total quantity is 80 and it drives the price down to 40 then we're going to split $3,200, that's $1,600 each, right? So that's how we've set this up. Now let's suppose that we think about a couple of extremes. We want to know what the likely outcome is for these two firms. The way we're going to figure this out is we're going to think about what the outcome would be if there was just one firm, 
And then we're going to think about what the outcome would be if this was a perfectly competitive market. So let's start by thinking about the outcome if this was a monopoly. If monopoly. Well, if it's a monopoly, then there's no uncertainty. If it's a monopoly, we know exactly what the demand curve looks like, and we would maximize profit by producing a quantity of 60. The price will end up being 60, and we would end up with $3,600. Now, let's look at how we know that. Okay, so our demand curve looks like this. It's 120, 120. There's what the demand curve looks like. Let's think about what the marginal revenue curve looks like. The marginal revenue curve has the same intercept as the demand curve and twice the slope. So it's going to come down here like that. If it has twice the slope, then it's going to hit right here at 60. Now we've got our demand curve and we've got our marginal revenue curve. In order to figure out the profit maximizing decision for a monopoly, we need the marginal cost curve. But the marginal cost curve is zero. Marginal cost lies right on the horizontal axis, right down there. There's our marginal cost curve. So we look where marginal cost equals marginal revenue, which happens right there. The firm will produce 60 gallons. It gets its price from the demand curve. And if we look at a quantity of 60 gallons, the price is 60. There's the outcome for a monopoly. It would earn a profit of $3,600. And it gets to keep all of that because it's the only firm in town. There's the monopoly outcome. And of course, it's going to make as much profit as it's possible to make. It's good to be the monopolist. Now let's think about what would happen if this was perfect competition. So let's say if perfect competition. So if it's perfect competition, then price equals marginal cost in a perfectly competitive market. We've already seen that. If it's perfect competition, then price is equal to zero. If price is equal to zero, the quantity would be 120. So price equals zero, quantity equals 120, and profit would be equal to zero, just like we would expect to see in a perfectly competitive market. And that shouldn't be surprising because the way a perfectly competitive market works is that we would simply look at the intersection between the demand curve and the supply curve. And the supply curve, which is the marginal cost curve, lies right on the horizontal axis, right there. And so we're looking at that intersection, and that happens at a quantity of 120 and a price equal to zero. There's no profit to be made in a perfectly competitive market. And you might ask, well, gosh, that doesn't make any realistic sense because you're making zero dollars here. It doesn't make sense for the pumping of water to be costless. I get that. We could make marginal cost positive. We could make marginal cost $10. And then the price would end up being $10. But remember, profit being equal to zero means that all costs are covered, okay? Explicit and implicit. So this is the perfect competition outcome. So we know that if we had a monopoly, it would be this outcome. And if we had a perfectly competitive market, it would be this outcome. We know that oligopoly lies in between monopoly and perfect competition. So we would expect our oligopoly outcome to be somewhere in this range and probably closer to the monopoly outcome than the perfect competition outcome. So without knowing exactly what's going to happen, we would expect our, our oligopoly outcome to be somewhere probably up in this area. Okay. Now, you may already be thinking that one thing that could happen is that if you own a firm and I own a firm, we could in secret get together and agree to both bring 30 and then end up getting this monopoly outcome. We could collude with each other. If two firms are colluding, we call that a cartel. So one possible outcome 
is for the firms to, com to collude with each other and form a cartel. It turns out that forming a cartel is unlikely. There's going to be an incentive to do that, but there's also going to be an incentive for the firms to break any agreement that they formed. And so one of the reasons that they might want to do that is, or, or that it's going to be challenging is they would have to decide first how to split output and they'd have to decide how to split the profits. So let's say, for example, you own a company, uh, one of the water companies and I own the other one and we're sitting down in secret to talk about colluding with each other. We can't do it out in the open because it's illegal to collude. So we're sitting down in secret and I say, you know what, look, um, I'm, I'm an economics professor. I know more about this than you do, so I should get a bigger share of the profit. And you might say, well, you don't have to know anything about economics to know that this is the best possible outcome. So you, maybe we should split it equally. And if we start to bicker about how to split the profits, then the collusive agreement might break down. There's another reason why we would expect not to see a collusive agreement. And that is that even if we do form an agreement, the, that agreement itself contains the seeds of its own self-destruction. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Let's uh, actually, what I want to do is clear off one half of this and we'll work the rest of this out over here. Let's suppose that you and I form a collusive agreement. So in secret, we get together and we say, okay, look, here's, here's what we need to do. We need to each bring 30 gallons, and if we each bring 30 gallons, the total quantity is going to be 60, the price will be 60, we're going to make total $3,600 of profit, and we'll split that down the middle. So your profit is gonna be the 30 gallons you bring times the 60, the price, the uh, price of $60, which is $1,800. Mine will also be 30 gallons times the price of 60, which is $1,800. The 1,800 two times is the 36. That's the best we can do. So let's suppose you decide we agree on that. We shake hands, okay? Here's the problem with that. So firm A, let's, let's say this. If firm A expects firm B to bring 30 gallons, which is the agreement that we have come to. You expect me to bring 30, I expect you to bring 30. Well, let's suppose I'm firm A. If I expect you to bring 30, then I can reason this way. Firm A can reason this way. I could bring 30. That's one option. I can abide by the agreement. I can bring 30. That means that the total quantity, let's say total quantity equals 60, the price equals 60, and my profit is going to equal $1,800. That's the agreement. Or, I can bring a little bit more than that. I can bring 40. Think about what happens if you bring 30, but I show up with 40. So if I bring 40, now, while you bring 30, the total quantity will be 70. If the total quantity is 70, then that's going to drive the price down to 50. Price goes to $50, but notice what that does for me. If I bring 40 gallons and I sell each gallon for $50, my profit is all of a sudden $2,000. So if I expect you to bring 30, it's in my best interest to actually bring a little bit more than that, bring 40, because I can get some profit above and beyond what I could have gotten if I abided by our agreement. Now notice what your profit is going to be. This is profit for me. This is firm A's profit. Your profit, profit for firm B, if you're bringing the 30 and selling it for $50 each, your profit falls to $1,500. So you get hurt by me breaking the agreement. But 
I walk away with $2,000. That's $200 more than I would have gotten if I would have, have abided by our agreement. Here's the catch. You can reason this way also. So let's say, but firm B can reason the same way. So if you expect me to bring 30, then it's in your best interest to bring 40. If you bring 40 while I bring 30, then the total quantity will be 70, the price will be driven down to 50, but your profit will be 2,000. Mine will fall to 1,500. Now, if both of us are reasoning this way, you're sitting at home tonight and I'm sitting at home tonight and I'm thinking, oh, they're gonna bring 30, so I'm showing up tomorrow with 40. And you're thinking, you're sitting at home tonight and you're thinking, oh, Dr. Azevedo is gonna bring 30, so I'm showing up tomorrow with 40 then the likely outcome is that we both show up tomorrow with 40. Likely outcome, we both bring 40. Now let's think about the situation that leaves us in. If we both bring 40, then the total quantity will be 80. If the total quantity is 80, then that means the price is going to be driven down to 40. And notice that in that case, the profit for me and the profit for you is going to be the 40 gallons that you brought times the price of 40, that's $1,600, and the profit for me will be the 40 gallons that I brought times the price of 40, which is $1,600. Notice that the likely outcome with a duopoly is right there. Both of us bringing 40, total quantity of 80, the price is 40, this is the likely outcome for a duopoly. Notice that the likely outcome results in a total profit equal to $3,200, which is not as good as the profit for us would have been had we formed the agreement. So you might think, well, okay, so if we show up tomorrow, each with 40, and we both walk away with $1,600, we can do better than that. We can do better than that if tomorrow we bring 30. If we'll both bring 30, then we'll walk away each with $1,800. So let's form an agreement. You bring 30 and I'll bring 30, and then we're right back to this. If I think you're gonna bring 30, I'm probably gonna bring 40, because I can walk away with $2,000. So the, the, the collusive agreement contains the seeds of its own destruction, and here's what it boils down to. Once we form the collusive agreement, it removes uncertainty. If I know what you're going to do, I can exploit that to my advantage. And if you know what I'm going to do, you can exploit that to your advantage. So the, the agreement itself creates an opportunity to do better than the agreement for each player. And the likely outcome is that you won't be able to form the agreement. People are going to have a strong incentive to break the agreement. Notice that what we're seeing here is that there is oftentimes a difference between what, doing what's in your own best interest versus doing what's in the best interest of an organization, or in this case, the two players. If we think about the two players as a team, then what's in the best interest of the team is to act like a monopolist. But if we're going to act like a monopolist, then each player has to ignore what's in their own best interest because what's in their own best interest is to break the agreement and go walk away with $2,000. There's conflict there. And that's true about a lot of things out there in the real world. It is not the case that what is in your own best interest is also in the best interest of the organization. And we can very easily see this in sports contests or we can see it in firms. What's in the best interest of an individual baseball player is not always what's in the best interest of the team. So sometimes for, for a team to win, 
Sometimes the players have to put their own individual best interest aside. The problem with that is that that can hurt them in the long run, and so they, they have this conflict. It happens with working situations. What's in the best interest of the business is not always what's in the best interest of the individual worker. And so sometimes we see workers engaging in behavior that is in their best interest, but not in the best interest of the business. And it boils down to this. There's, there's conflicting incentives, and you have to make a decision. What's most important to me? Doing what's in the best interest of, of you and I together, or doing what's in my best interest? So this really demonstrates the uncertainty that an oligopoly faces. They don't know exactly what the other firm is going to do, and that makes their decision harder. They have to try to, to guess about what the other firm is going to do. So what we want to do now is clear this off, and then we're going to talk about a little bit different type of game that we call the prisoner's dilemma. Let's talk about one of the most basic games in game theory, and that's a game that we call the prisoner's dilemma. And you've probably actually seen The Prisoner's Dilemma played out, maybe in a, a movie or TV shows. You, you'll recognize it as soon as we start to talk about it. So here's how The Prisoner's Dilemma works. Let's suppose there are two criminals and they get caught in, say, a minor crime. So two criminals get caught. Engaged in a minor crime. And, and they're caught red-handed. The police have all of the evidence they need to convict them of this minor crime. But let's suppose that the police suspect them of a major crime and they want them to confess. So police suspect them for a major crime. And want a confession. So maybe uh, these people get pulled over and um, they've, they've uh, got some drugs in the car or something, or maybe they're, they're pulled over and they're speeding on the highway, and so they've got these people for this minor crime, but in the trunk of the car they see uh, um, things that would be used for robbing a bank, and let's suppose there was a bank that had been robbed, and, and uh, they want them to confess to this major crime. So let's think about how they get them to confess. Most people kind of take this shortcut to thinking, and most people would argue that the police get confessions by um, somehow beating it out of criminals, and, and I'm not going to say that's never happened. I'm positive that that's happened, but there's a much more elegant way to do it. And the way that you do it is you understand the fact that Criminals face conflicting incentives. There's a set of incentives for the team of the criminals, the, the pair, but there's also an individual incentive that each of them is looking out for, individual self-interest. And so if you can put them into a dilemma where they choose their own individual self-interest over the team's interest, then you can get a confession. So here's how the prisoner's dilemma works. The first step, you probably already know it, you separate them. You separate them and you put them in, in a dilemma. And here's what the dilemma looks like. You tell each of them separately, right now we can lock you up for let's say a year. Right now we've got all the evidence we need to lock you up for a year. Say one year. But if you'll confess and implicate your partner, then we'll let you go free and your partner goes to jail or to prison for, let's say, 20 years. So if you confess and implicate your partner, you go free and your partner gets 20 years. But, you need to do it quickly. 
Because if everybody confesses, if you confess and your partner confesses, then we don't need your testimony. Everybody confessed and we'll lock you up for say eight years. So if you both confess, you'll get eight years. So you better do it real quick before your partner confesses. Because if your partner confesses first, you're gone for 20 years. Okay. The beauty of this is it, it puts them in a real dilemma. And we need to understand how to analyze this, this dilemma. The way that we're going to do this, if we want to understand kind of the likely outcome of this game, we have to create what I'm going to call a game matrix. So each of the players has two strategies. There's two players. Each criminal is a player. They have two strategies. They can confess or they can remain silent. And then depending upon the combination of who confesses and who remains silent, we get to observe the outcome or their payoff. So let's create what I'm going to call this game matrix. It's going to be a, a box. I'm going to divide it up into four cells here and I'm using the word cells to refer to it like you would in matrix algebra, not the criminal version of cells. So let's put over here on one side, let's put criminal two over here, and let's put criminal one up here. And then these two rows right here are going to correspond to criminal two's two strategies. Let's put confess here and remain silent. And then criminal one has the same two strategies. Let's put confess here and remain silent. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide each of these boxes in half this way. And we're going to put the payoffs in the box. And we're going to put criminal one's payoff up in the top right hand corner of each box and criminal two's payoff in the bottom left hand corner of each box. So let's start with this one. Right now we can lock you up for one year. So if neither of them confess, then criminal one, then both of them remain silent. That puts us down in this box, right down here, where criminal two remains silent and criminal one remains silent. Each of them gets one year. So we're going to say one year for criminal one and one year in prison for criminal two. Okay. The other outcome, let's start do the, this one next. If they both confess, they each get eight years. Well, if criminal two confesses, we're in this row. If criminal one confesses, we're in this column. So if they both confess, we're right here and they're both going to get eight years. So there's the payoff for criminal one Here's the payoff for criminal two. So now if that was the extent of the game, then it's easy to solve, right? If that's the extent of the game, then both of them remain silent and they get one year. And we all know that the unwritten code of being a criminal is that you deny everything and stick to your story. You, you don't you don't confess to things. Everybody knows that it's not in the best interest of the criminals to confess because if they confess, they get eight years. If they remain, remain silent, they get one year. But it's these off diagonal elements that are going to be the fly in the ointment for each of the criminals. It's this one right here that causes the dilemma for them. So now if you confess and implicate your partner, you go free. So let's think about what that, how that looks. If criminal one confesses and criminal two remains silent, then criminal one is going to get zero years and criminal two is going to get 20 years. If criminal one, or excuse me, if criminal two confesses and criminal one remains silent, then criminal one is going to get 20 years and criminal two, the one who confessed, gets zero years. Now we've got the game matrix put together and now we need to think about how do we analyze this game matrix. So the best outcome in terms of the team of criminals is this one right there. If they could collude with each other and both agree to remain silent, that's the best outcome. 
that would correspond in the, the problem we had over here with the monopoly outcome. Now that problem we had over here was a much more complicated problem because there, each firm had more than two strategies. So if we were to con going to put the game matrix together for that, that two firms selling water problem, that would be complicated. Any problem I would expect you to be able to solve on a homework or a test, we're going to have two players, two strategies, and you will analyze it this way. If you were to go on and study um, game theory, and we've got a game theory class here at UCM, and it's a very popular class, you would do more complicated um, games than this one. The field of game theory is fascinating, and um, I would encourage you to take that class because a lot of people really enjoy it. Um, so let's think about how to solve this problem. So the way that we're going to solve this as we is that we need to think about, let's write first the best outcome for the team or for the pair. Best outcome for the pair is to remain silent. What we're going to see is it's going to be very, very, very difficult to achieve that outcome and the likely outcome is that they end up confessing. But let's figure out how we, we understand that. So here's the way that we're going to do this. We want to take the point of view of the criminals one at a time. So let's take criminal one's point of view. Criminal one. They've got two options. And let's think about what the other criminal can do. From criminal one's perspective, Criminal 2 could confess or could remain silent. So if Criminal 2 confesses, let's think about what's in the best interest of Criminal 1. So if Criminal 2 confesses, then we're in this row right here. Criminal 1 is going to either get 8 years in prison or 20 years in prison. They'd rather have 8 years in prison, so if they know that Criminal two is going to confess, it's in the best interest of criminal one to confess. So if criminal two confesses, I should confess. Criminal two might not confess. Criminal two might remain silent. So if criminal two remains silent, well in that case we're in this row. If criminal two is going to remain silent, then criminal one is either going to get zero years or one year, and they'd rather have zero years. So if criminal one knows that criminal two is going to remain silent, it's in criminal one's best interest to confess. I should confess. Notice that it's always in criminal one's best interest to confess. This is what we call a dominant strategy. So confessing is a dominant strategy for criminal one. A strategy is dominant if it's always the best strategy, regardless of what the other player does. Let's do this for criminal two. Let's take criminal two's perspective and we're going to see that it works out exactly the same way. So let's say if one confesses, if one confesses, so now we're taking criminal two's perspective. If, if one confesses, then we're in this column. That means criminal two is either going to get eight years or 20, and they'd rather have the eight. So if they know that one is going to confess, criminal two should confess. But criminal one might not confess. Criminal one might remain silent. So if one remains silent, in that case, now we're in this column. And criminal two is either going to get zero years or one year, and they'd rather have zero years in prison than one. So if criminal two knows that criminal one is going to remain silent, criminal two should confess. I should confess. 
confess. So notice that confessing is a dominant strategy for criminal too. Confessing is a dominant strategy for both of the criminals. The likely outcome of this game is that they both confess and both spend eight years in prison. Even though they know that it's in the best interest of them as a team to remain silent, to deny everything and stick to your story. The likely outcome is that they confess and, and you don't need to beat it out of them. You just need to understand the prisoner's dilemma. So, let's think about a couple of characteristics of this game. We're going to think about the likely outcome. Both confess. That doesn't always happen. We'll talk here in just a second about the conditions under which we might expect them to be able to both remain silent, to get that good outcome. There are some times when that happens. And notice also that we're making a, we're making a, a, not so much a probability statement, but we would never say that this is the guaranteed outcome. It's different for the two criminals. It's different for every prisoner's dilemma situation would be a little different from every other one. But what we're saying is that unless we have other information, we would predict that the likely outcome is that they both confess. Now that's a bad outcome from their perspective, but it is what we call the Nash equilibrium. So this is a Nash equilibrium. Let me give you the definition of a Nash equilibrium. And I'm just going to say it so that you can pause the video and then you can write it in your notes. But a Nash equilibrium is a situation where, given the strategies of the other players, no, st no player regrets their strategy. Okay. Given what the other players did, no player regrets their strategy. Now let's think about why this is a Nash equilibrium while these other three outcomes cannot be a Nash equilibrium. So let's suppose the game has been played. We have observed that, let's say you're a criminal and I'm a criminal. I observed that you confessed. You observed that I confessed. We don't like that because we're going to spend eight years in jail. But the question is, do either of us regret our strategy? Do you wish that you had remained silent? Because if I had confessed, and you remained silent, you would be in here for 20 years and I wouldn't be in here. And so you don't regret your strategy and I don't regret my strategy. Knowing that you confessed, I'm glad I confessed because if I would have remained silent, you would be gone out of here and I would be in here for 20 years instead of just eight. So this is a Nash equilibrium. Let's think about this one. So let's suppose that both of us are in prison for a year and we both remained silent. Do we regret that strategy? Well, I regret my choice. If I would have known you were actually going to remain silent, I would have rather confessed because then I wouldn't be in prison at all. So I do regret my strategy and you would regret your strategy. Knowing that I had remained silent, it would have been better if you had confessed. So this is not a Nash equilibrium. If you go through the process I just went through, you'll see that neither of these are Nash equilibria either. So we've got a situation where this is the Nash equilibria, though it's not a good outcome for the, the players that are involved. Okay, so knowing that something is a Nash equilibria doesn't mean it's necessarily a good outcome. It's good from society's viewpoint. It depends on the viewpoint you're taking, but it's not good from the viewpoint of um, the players involved. Now let's talk about this dominant strategy stuff. This is how you solve one of these problems. If I give you a problem and it would be set up like this, you put the game matrix together and then you figure out whether or not anybody has a dominant strategy. If you were to see that there's not a dominant strategy, then here's what it looks like. If criminal two confesses, I should confess. If criminal one or if criminal two remains silent, I should remain silent. That's what it would look like if there was not a dominant strategy. These two things would be different. If that's the case, then you would not be able to predict a light, likely outcome 
unless you had some more information. Okay? So if I were to give you a problem and you go through this process and you realize that neither of them have a dominant strategy, then you would just say there's no dominant strategy or, or I can't predict a likely outcome. But if one or both of them have a dominant strategy, then they're likely going to play their dominant strategy and then you can figure out what the likely outcome is going to be. So not all games have a Nash equilibrium. Some of them have multiple Nash equilibrium. I would give you a game that only if it's going to have a Nash equilibrium, it would have one. Let's think about when we, when the criminals might be able to confess. So when is cooperation more likely? When is cooperation, I think I forgot how to spell cooperation there, cooperation more likely? We don't always observe the criminals confessing. Sometimes there are situations where they do remain silent. And so we need to think about when is cooperation more likely? Well, one of the things that makes cooperation more likely is if this was a repeated game. So if it's a repeated game, then it's more likely that the players involved in the game will learn from the game. So let's go back to that, um, that two firm example where we're, we're selling water. And let's suppose we're having a hard time cooperating. We know that, that the best outcome is for both of us to bring 30 gallons, but day after day we bring 40. Then one thing that we could do is I could pull you aside and I could say, look, here's what's happening. We're, we're, we're both bringing 40, but we would be both better off if we bring 30. How about tomorrow? You bring 30, I swear I'll bring 30, and let's just see what happens. And suppose that you trust me and I trust you and so that next day we actually bring 30 and we realize that we're able to walk away with more profit than if we both bring 40. Then if we know that this game is going to be played tomorrow and the next day and the day after that, we might be able to realize that in a repeated game we are better off by cooperating. If it's a one-shot game, if tomorrow is the last time it's going to be played, then I'm going after that $2,000. If you want to bring 30, that's great, and I hope you do. But in a one-shot game, cooperation is highly unlikely. So that's one characteristic under which cooperation is more likely, or if they can punish each other. If the players in the game can punish each other for breaking the agreement, then cooperation is more likely. Okay, so if, if the players, before they go to prison, or let's say before they commit the crime, they know that each of them is willing to, let's say, kill the other one if they break the agreement, or have somebody else kill them, or maybe have somebody else kill a member of their family, then it's more likely that they're going to remain silent. Now we're adding something to the game there. It's not just this as the payoff. It's that there's another dimension. It's one year in prison, um, but if you confess, you're going to go free, but I'm going to have you killed. Okay, so we would have to alter the game to build that in there. But if the players can punish each other, then certainly there's a higher probability that um, we will observe cooperation between them. Or if they have a relationship. So if the two criminals are, let's say, brothers, well, there's a higher probability that we, they will observe, or that we will observe them cooperating with each other. So if I were going to engage in a crime, I wouldn't. But if I were, and I needed to pick an accomplice, rather than just picking somebody that I'm acquainted with that is handy at the time, I would rather pick my brother, one of my two brothers. I can trust both of them. I know they're not going to rat me out and I, they know I'm not going to rat them out. And so if I had to engage in a crime, I'm going to choose somebody that I can trust completely. 
And then there's a much higher probability that we're going to be able to observe cooperation. Um, the last one is if there's a small number of players. So if there's a small number of players, then it's more likely that we will observe cooperation, although even with two players, the smallest number of players there can be for it to be a game, it's still unlikely that we're going to observe cooperation. But imagine the situation if this is a group of 20 criminals that have all been caught. All that it takes is one of them to confess, and then the whole thing breaks down. So the higher the number of players, the smaller the probability they will actually be able to cooperate with each other. And if you think about, say, criminal organizations that have been successful for long periods of time, you'll start to see that those criminal organizations have some aspect of all of these involved. They will emphasize the, the family nature of the organization, and they will not hesitate to punish each other very violently, and it's a repeated game. Small number of players, usually if they're going to engage in a, a specific crime, they have a small number of people that are going to engage in it. So criminal organizations that are successful, they do that. Um, so there is, there are times when we observe cooperation, um, but it's not really that likely. A lot of times we observe confessing. What I'm going to do is I want you to, to go to YouTube now. I want you to pause this video. I want you to go to YouTube and there's going to be a link for you to click on. And I want you to search for, actually follow the link and it's going to take you to a video that is a clip out of the movie A Beautiful Mind. And in there, in that clip, um, you're going to observe a Beautiful Mind is a story about John Nash. John Nash came up with um, the Nash Equilibrium. He won the Nobel Prize for his work on what's become known as the Nash Equilibrium. And it has to do with this prisoner's dilemma and the inability to cooperate. And um, the movie A Beautiful Mind was made about John Nash and his life. And it's a fascinating movie. I would encourage you to watch it. But the scene I want you to watch in the movie is a scene where um, some, some guys have just passed their qualifying exams to get their PhD in economics. They've just passed their qualifying exams and they go out to a bar to celebrate. And while they're at a bar, some ladies walk in. And, and the way they portray John Nash as coming up with the Nash equilibrium is in this scene where he's observing what's happening with the ladies who have walked into the bar. So I want you to pause this for a second Go watch that video and then come back to this one and we'll talk for just a second about um, whether or not they do a very good job of illustrating the Nash Equilibrium. So I'll clear this off while you pause the video and watch that clip. So let's talk about that clip. So in the clip, the ladies walk into the bar and John Nash sees them and what he realizes is that the, the guys are all going to have an incentive to go after the, the one young lady who is better looking than the other ones. And the problem with that is going to be that they're going to go try to, to uh, get her attention and they're all going to essentially block each other and then what's going to happen is once they've been rejected by the good looking one, then they're going to try to go after her friends, but her friends are going to be upset because they didn't go after the friends first. And so everybody goes home empty handed. And what he realizes is there's a better outcome. And the better outcome is that what we need to do is ignore the good looking one. If what we will do is if we'll ignore her and just go directly after her friends, then her friends will be much more receptive to our advances and then everybody's gonna get paired off with one of these girls and everybody's happy. And that's where they end. And, and he jumps up uh, from the table and he says something about Adam Smith being wrong and he runs out and he thanks the lady on, her way, on his way out and 
and then he goes and writes his dissertation which won him the Nobel Prize in Economics. And when I ask my classes, we will watch that in a face-to-face -face class, and if I ask them, does that do a good job of illustrating what I just taught you, a lot of times students will say, yeah, it does. It, 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 it demonstrates that sometimes there's a better strategy. But I would argue that it, the movie does a terrible job of depicting the actual prisoner's dilemma. And the reason is because what John Nash, the way they depict it is that John Nash says there's a better strategy. The better strategy is that we all agree not to go after the one good looking one. But now think about what that collusive agreement creates. It contains the seeds of its own destruction. If we all agree not to go after the good looking one, if you know your friends are not going to go after the good looking one, what's in your best interest? Well, it's in your best interest to go after the good looking one. But that's true for all of them. So they can form this collusive agreement to ignore her. But if you know everybody's going to ignore her, then it's in your best interest to be the one person who doesn't ignore her because then she's going to be more receptive to you. And yet all of them face that same incentive. So the end result is that they all still go after the good looking one, right? So in my opinion, the movie, while I like the movie and, and I think there are some good things about the movie, it's very interesting. And I think if you're interested in, in learning more about John Nash, reading the book that that, that movie is based on is uh, it's a very interesting book. Um, John Nash was killed not too many years ago in uh, he and his wife were riding in a taxi cab in New York that was hit by another car and it killed both of them. But John Nash had a very interesting life and um, uh, in a lot of ways a very tragic life because he suffered suffered from schizophrenia. Um, so I think the movie is decent, but I don't think that they do a very good job of actually illustrating the conflicting incentives that, that the prisoner's dilemma is designed to, to demonstrate. Let's take that prisoner's dilemma, because in this class we're not really that interested in whether or not criminals confess. We're more interested in, in how firms behave. And so let's take this prisoner's dilemma and let's think about how it would work if we had two firms competing against each other. So let's think about a duopoly game. And this will be a simpler, a more simple game than the one we had with the two firms selling water. So let's suppose we have two firms and these two firms are in a town. Um, suppose it's Walmart and Target. And let's suppose both of the uh, stores sell some game system. That's the, um, each firm sells the gaming system. I'm not going to demonstrate how out of touch I am with gaming systems by, by giving you the name of one because it'll just make me look foolish. So whatever your favorite gaming system is, that's the one we're talking about. So Walmart sells it, Target sells it. They're the only two places that the people in town can buy it. And let's pretend they can't go to another town to buy it. If anybody wants to buy the gaming system, they have to buy it from one of those two places. And let's suppose that the manager of each store has to decide whether to charge a low price or whether to charge a high price. So the two strategies are to charge a low price or charge a high price. So let me go ahead and give you the game matrix here. Let's set this up same way we set up our prisoner's dilemma. So each of these stores, each of the managers is going to have those two strategies. Let's put Target up here at the top and let's put Walmart, Walmart over here. And let's put, um, let's suppose the two prices, let's suppose the low price is $400 and the high price is $600. So those are the two choices. We could have more choices, but we want to keep this fairly simple. So let's suppose we put our two strategies right here. Charge $600 or $400. Walmart can charge 600 
or 400. Let's divide these cells in half and we'll put the payoff to target up in the top right corner and we'll put the payoff to Walmart in the bottom left corner of each of these cells. Let's suppose if um, both of them sell it for $400, let's suppose that they each make $7,500 profit. On the other hand, if they both sell it for a high price, let's suppose they both make $10,000 in profit. Now, if those were the only two things that they had to worry about, then clearly what they want to do is both sell it for $600. Both stores will make more profit if they will agree to sell it for $600 than they would if they both sell it for $400. Here's the catch though. Let's suppose that one of them sells it for $600 while the other one sells it for $400. In that case, the one that sells it for 400 is going to be able to steal customers away from the other one. And so the one that sells it for 400, let's suppose they make $15,000 in profit and the one that sells it for 600 makes $5,000 in profit. Down here, it's Target that's selling it for 600 and Walmart that's selling it for 400. So Walmart would get the $15,000 in profit and Target gets the $5,000 in profit. And so what we've got here is the classic prisoner's dilemma. The best outcome for the two firms is for them to both sell it for $600. The problem is if you'll analyze this game the way I taught you to analyze a game, you'll see that selling it for $400 is the dominant strategy. And so the likely outcome of this game is that outcome, both of them selling it for $400, earning less profit than if they would sell it for $600. And you might think, well, they should just agree to sell it for $600. Well, keep in mind that colluding is against the law, but let's suppose they do agree. Well, if you're Target and I'm Walmart and I, and I know we have agreed to sell it for $600 and I think you're going to sell it for $600, it's in my best interest to sell it for $400 because then I can get this $15,000 in profit instead of $10,000. I'd rather have $15,000 than $10,000. So selling it for the low price is a dominant strategy um, even though there's a better outcome. Now again, if this was a repeated game or if these firms could somehow punish each other Every once in a while, I have a student raise their hand and say, hey, you know what, I've, I've figured this out. All they need to do, all Walmart and Target need to do is sign a legally binding contract to sell it for $600. That's illegal, right? You can't do that because the whole collusive agreement between firms is illegal. It's, it's outlawed by the Sherman Antitrust Act and a whole bunch of antitrust legislation. So if you show up at... Uh, you know, in front of a, a, a judge and say, hey, look, I've got this agreement. I'm the manager of Walmart and, and the t manager of Target and I so both signed this agreement to collude, you're going to get in big trouble. So you can't do that. So it all has to be done secretly. Um, and we tend to see very little collusion. Now, that doesn't mean we see no collusion. If you look at at kind of classic examples of um, collusion out there in the real world, the airline industry, there's been um, situations where different airlines have colluded with each other. Actually, if you're interested, there's a fascinating podcast. Um, the podcast is one edition of This American Life. And uh, the title of the podcast is The Fix Is In. It was done... Um, I think maybe three or four years ago, it's been a number of years ago that it was when I first heard it, um, and it is a fascinating podcast about a story of a guy who had been engaged in some illegal activity, but he agreed to be kind of an informant for the FBI, 
um, to help them nail some international firms that were colluding to fix the price of something. Off the top of my head, I can't even remember what it was they were um, selling. But it is a fascinating um, discussion of exactly the, the secret nature of collusion and, and how firms do it out there in the real world and, and how they can get caught doing it. So I would highly encourage you to listen to that podcast. Um, let's talk about some other examples of how we can apply this um, collusion or inability to collude uh, result that we've just gotten. Because it, it applies to a lot of very interesting things out there in the real world that don't really have anything to do with um, firms making decisions. Notice in this chapter that we are not drawing the cost curves for firms and looking where marginal cost equals marginal revenue, but that would be going on behind the scenes here. These firms would be, to the extent that they can, trying to figure out where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. The problem for them is there's a massive amount of uncertainty. They don't know exactly what demand curve they're going to face any particular day. And so knowing what their marginal revenue curve, it, it, it's very challenging. They don't know what it looks like. And it can look different from one day to the next, depending upon what the other firms are doing. So that's what we're focusing on, why we're focusing on the game theory aspect of it, rather than just a marginal cost curve and a marginal revenue curve. But keep in mind, these firms are still going to be trying to maximize their profit. It's just that there's uncertainty. So let's think of some other ways that we can apply this, this prisoner's dilemma idea. One of them is in terms of advertising. So we tend to see a fair amount of advertising with oligopolies. The problem is for oligopolies, the advertising typically doesn't help them. We see a lot of it. But let's think about why. If we go back and we look at um, monopolistic competition, we talked about the fact that there's going to be a strong incentive for those firms to advertise, to market themselves. And the reason is they need to try to further differentiate their product. If they can do that, they can shift that residual demand curve to the right. And at least for a while, they have a shot at making a positive economic profit. So we see a lot of advertising in that, that type of uh, market structure. With a uh, oligopoly, we also see a lot of advertising. You see Coke and Pepsi do a lot of advertising. You see the airlines do advertising. You see um, cable companies advertise. You see Direct TV and Dish Network advertising. You see a lot of advertising here. The problem is, the advertising for these firms tends to be relatively unproductive and the firms would be much happier if they didn't have to do it. So let's think about a couple of cigarette companies advertising. So kind of this is kind of a classic example that's described in a lot of economics textbooks. Let me show you kind of what the game matrix looks like for two cigarette companies that are deciding whether or not to advertise. Let's make our uh, two companies Marlboro and let's say Camel. Let's suppose that each company has two strategies. They can either advertise or not advertise. I'll abbreviate that. So advertise or not advertise. Let's break up the cells into have so we can write the payoffs. Let's suppose that if both of them advertise, Marlboro gets $3 billion in profit, and uh, let's say Camel also gets $3 billion in profit. If, on the other hand, they don't advertise, let's suppose that uh, Marlboro gets $4 billion in profit, and Camel gets $4 billion in profit. And you might ask, well, why? That doesn't make sense. Why, why would the payoffs look like that? Well, actually, it makes perfect sense. If you think about why people choose to smoke, people do not choose to smoke because of advertising. So it's not the case that a non-smoker is out um, 
getting gas at the pumps and they're sitting there filling up their car and they look up on top of the pumps and they see that, hey, lo and behold, Marlboro cartons are on sale this week. And th think to themselves, you know what? I've never smoked in my life, but they've got a sale on Marlboro carton, so I'm going to go get me a carton and start smoking. That's not why people choose to smoke. People choose to smoke because their friends smoke, their parents smoke. They choose to smoke for reasons other than advertising. Okay, so the advertising doesn't get new customers for Marlboro or Camel. So they would be better off if they didn't spend the money on the advertising. So from their perspective, this is the best outcome. If they advertise, they're not going to generate new smokers. They're going to, that dollars spent on advertising, it, it has no payoff for them. And so they end up making less profit overall. Here's what does happen when you advertise though. If you advertise and the competitor doesn't, then people who are already smokers start to switch brands. So if Camel chooses to advertise while Marlboro chooses not to advertise, Camel can steal some of the market away from Marlboro. And so the firm that advertises is going to make a bigger profit than the firm that doesn't. So let's suppose that if Camel chooses to advertise, but Marlboro doesn't. We're up here in this box. Let's suppose Marlboro gets two billion in profit and Camel gets five billion in profit. On the other hand, if Marlboro chooses to advertise while Camel chooses not to advertise, then Marlboro's going to, going to get the five billion in profit and Camel gets the two billion. Now, if you'll analyze this the way I taught you to do it, what you'll see is that the likely outcome for this game is both of them to advertise. Advertising is a dominant strategy. And so the likely outcome is right up here. Even though there is a better outcome for these two firms, they would rather not advertise, but advertising is a dominant strategy. Let me pause here for a second before we talk more about this and just show you that the likely outcome is not always going to be up in the upper left hand corner because in this game, the likely outcome is in the bottom right hand corner. It depends on where you put your, your two strategies. So you could analyze this game and another person could analyze the game and switch the numbers here and their likely outcome would be in a different location. Okay, so the reason I say that is don't get used to thinking that once you put the game matrix together, you just need to circle the top left corner. That's not how it's always going to work. So let's go back to this example. If you were to go back to the, the early 70s, um, cigarette companies did a lot of advertising on television. And you can actually get on YouTube, YouTube and search for old... Um, cigarette commercials and they're, they're incredibly um, odd to watch because we just can't imagine having a commercial like that on television. But they used to have commercials and then Congress decided that what they would do is they would punish the cigarette industry by not allowing them to advertise on television. They would have to advertise in magazines or they could advertise in stores or other places but they couldn't advertise on television. And at the time, the cigarette companies kind of stood back and said, oh gosh, don't do that to us. Please don't make it illegal for us to advertise. But they didn't really oppose it very much. And so what ended up happening was the legislation passed and they prohibited the cigarette companies from advertising on television. And if you look at the profits that the cigarette companies earned, they went up after that. And you might ask, well, why? Well, here's why because the government solved the prisoner's dilemma for the cigarette companies. The, governor, the government made advertising, at least in, on television, illegal. And that moved them down here to this outcome that they wanted to be at from the beginning. And so what you see is we still see um, a push for restrictions on cigarette companies and what they can do and whether or not they can advertise within 20 feet of a candy counter and as if advertising within 20 feet of a candy counter actually has anything to do with whether or not people smoke. We still see 
pressure put on to restrict the ability of cigarette companies to advertise and the cigarette companies kind of standing back and saying, oh, you know what? Don't do that. Please don't do that. But that's exactly what they want. If you want to hurt the cigarette companies, let them advertise. Let them advertise wherever they want. Now, I'm not advocating that as something we should do. But if your goal is to drain the cigarette companies of dollars, you should make advertising easy for them because it's not going to help them get new smokers and they don't want to do it in the first place. So this is a good example of how we can use this prisoner's dilemma and, and what we know from it to understand something that we see out there in the real world. This also applies to a lot of other things. If we think about the arms race, I think your book may have a discussion of the arms race as a prisoner's dilemma. Here's the situation. If, if we think about two countries, let's make it simple. Two countries, two strategies. Either arm or disarm. So you either have nuclear weapons or you don't. Well, there are two inherently safe situations in the world. One situation is where nobody has any nuclear weapons. And the other situation is where everybody has a nuclear weapon. And that's a safe situation because of mutual assurance of destruction. If you're going to push the button, to nuke another country, you know they're also going to push the button, so you're essentially pushing the button to kill yourself. So both of those are, are inherently safe situations. The unsafe thing is when one country has them and the other doesn't. And if you look at the outcome of that game, arming yourself is a dominant strategy. And so we tend to see countries arming themselves. And if you want to understand how we could somehow get to probably, without argument, a better outcome where nuclear weapons didn't even exist, I don't think there's any doubt in anybody's mind that that is the best outcome of the game. The problem is it's a dominant strategy to arm. So it's not the case that politicians are just stupid and that, that they all they care about is killing everybody else, so that's why they want these weapons. It's a dominant strategy. If we want to understand how to change that, then we have to go, I've erased them, but if you go back to the conditions under which we would expect cooperation, if we want agreements, arms agreements, then we have to recognize that this world we live in is a repeated game. We have to have relationships between countries. So it's easier to cooperate if the countries have a relationship. So if countries are isolating themselves, that's not good for solving that, that prisoner's dilemma. If there's an ability to punish a country if they break the agreement, then we have a higher probability of observing cooperation. So setting up international um, organizations that have authority to punish a country if it does something that is not abiding by the agreement, that can be one way to um, get closer to that good outcome of not having any nuclear weapons at all. So the arms race is a good example of the prisoner's dilemma. Another excellent example is dirty campaigning. This is something that we're all used to seeing these days. It's something that um, people complain about and if you go to the barber shop you'll hear people talking about how politicians are just dirty these days and all they ever do is dirty campaigning. Well if you think about it, it's a dominant strategy. Let's suppose nobody campaigns dirty. Okay, If nobody campaigns dirty, that's one possible outcome. Or if everybody campaigns dirty, if nobody campaigns dirty, then voters tend not to switch. If everybody campaigns dirty, voters tend not to switch. What happens though is if one person runs a clean campaign and the other person runs a dirty campaign, then voters tend to switch towards the person that's running the dirty campaign. Because if somebody's talking bad about your candidate and your candidate is not responding, then you start to think to yourself, you know what? If that wasn't true, I'd speak up and I'd say something. But if your candidate just keeps their mouth shut, then people start to think, well, maybe it's true. And they start to switch. And so what you start to realize real quickly is that if you want, that dirty campaigning is a dominant strategy. 
Believe me, the candidates would love to not spend all the money that they have to spend running those dirty ads. They don't want to do that. It's not that politicians are inherently more dirty than anybody else. That's not, that's a shortcut to thinking. That's not the way it works. It's that if you are going to run a clean campaign, no matter what, you're probably going to lose. Unless somehow you are lucky enough to be running against another candidate who is not going to campaign dirty. And we do see some of that. Sometimes we do see two candidates that, that they don't really say anything bad about the other uh, candidate. But here's the real thing. We, you might think, well, let's just outlaw dirty campaigning. Well, how do you do that? How do you outlaw something when it, you can't even define what it means to campaign dirty? If, if somebody voted for something and I point that out as a candidate, does that mean that that's a dirty campaign? I mean, you might not like that if you like the other person and I point out that they, they voted this way or they didn't vote this way. So somehow defining what it means to campaign dirty, that's, that's impossible. So it's a dominant strategy and I don't know how to fix it. Um, I guess we can think about using some of those conditions under which cooperation is more likely but that's really challenging with uh, dirty campaigning. So you can see that there are a lot of applications of this prisoner's dilemma, not just to firms and how firms make decisions, but to um, you know, lots of other things that we tend to see. Game theory is very useful for analyzing sports situations. It's very useful for analyzing uh, military strategy situations. It's really widely applicable to a lot of different things that we observe out there in the real world. So let's kind of conclude this discussion of um, oligopoly with a couple of different things. So the first thing is that collusion is unlikely. If I ask my students at the beginning of a principal's class whether they think collusion is likely, Many students will say that it's happening all the time, that all firms are colluding against us. No, they're not. They're not. As a matter of fact, we don't see collusion with perfect competition. If you think about the gasoline market, it's tempting to think that firms are colluding because when you drive into a town, you see that all the gas stations have a price that's pretty close to everybody else's. That tempts you into thinking that there has to be somebody behind it. But what's happening there is just that the incentives are driving everybody to that price. That's what happens when you have a market. Wherever the demand curve and the supply curve intersect, the price is going to be driven to that price. And so when you observe all of the gas stations having a price that's within a few cents of each other, it makes you think as if they're colluding. But they're not. They're just responding to the incentives that are created at their particular gas station. We don't see collusion obviously with monopoly and we don't see collusion with monopolistic competition because there's so many firms that the number of firms is too high for them to collude. It's not until we get to oligopoly that we see collusion and even then it's hard for oligopolies to agree to collude and then stick to it. So collusion is unlikely but it does sometimes happen. So let's say but sometimes happens. The second thing is that we have to keep in mind that firms have conflicting incentives. Firms have conflicting incentives. This is true with regards to a lot of things in life. There's not, actually most of the time, there's not one right answer. Life would be simple if there was always one right answer. But really, that's what the study of economics is about, is, is understanding that everything has benefits and everything has costs. And sometimes there's uncertainty about those benefits and costs. And that makes problem solving challenging. It's one thing if you know exactly what the benefits are and exactly what the costs are. But there's uncertainty. There's uncertainty created by um, the fact that life itself contains randomness as, and is uncertain. It's uncertain in part because other people, their behavior is uncertain, the behavior of firms is uncertain. 
So firms have conflicting incentives and that makes problem solving challenging. Here's the other thing. It's good for society that firms have a difficult time colluding. It's good for society that firms have a difficult time colluding. We're kind of uh, taught to think that cooperation is always the best thing. That if we could always just cooperate, eh, life would be way easier. There are times when that's true. I would argue, though, that there are lots of times we do not want people cooperating. We certainly don't want firms cooperating with each other because when firms cooperate, that drives the price up for consumers. It's good for the firms if they can cooperate, but it's bad for consumers. It creates deadweight loss. And so it's a good thing that firms have a difficult time colluding. It's a good thing that criminals have a difficult time colluding. It's a good thing that, that the police are able to get criminals to confess. Society is made better off by that. So some types of cooperation are good. But there are lots of times when we do not want to observe cooperation. The other thing is, and let's finish with this, the more firms there are, the less likely cooperation is. The more firms there are, the less likely cooperation is. I would argue that this is also a useful piece of information to keep in mind when you're thinking about something like um, a conspiracy theory. So if you're thinking about some conspiracy, I would argue that we can use what we've learned right here to come up with a good rule of thumb for whether or not there's anything behind a conspiracy theory or not. And this piece of information right here is very useful. Any conspiracy theory that involves a lot of people, I'm not very, uh, I'm not going to lend much credence to that. If there's a conspiracy theory that involves a lot of people to pull it off and a lot of people to keep their mouth shut, I'm not going to buy it. That's not to say that there aren't some conspiracy theories out there that, that are actually happening. I don't know. Uh, there have been conspiracies in the history of the world that we know of that involve some people keeping their mouth shut, and they did, or at least they did for a while. But if we're talking about large numbers of people keeping their mouth shut or large numbers of people cooperating with each other to pull it off, I don't know. There's a lot of evidence that tells me that that's very unlikely. It's not completely unheard of. But the more people have to be involved in it, the less likely it is that they're all going to be able to cooperate and then continue to keep their mouth shut unless there's some ability to punish them. And if there is, if they know that speaking up is going to get themselves killed, well, yeah, that, that increases the probability. So we can, we can generalize a lot of this information to other things besides just um, firms producing goods and services. But keep in mind, really what we're after here is this fourth market structure where we're talking about um, how this compares to monopoly and monopolistic competition and perfect competition. And this fits in with um, right in between monopoly and monopolistic competition, closer to monopoly. If we increase the number of firms, we get closer and closer to monopolistic competition. It depends on how differentiated the goods are. So hopefully this gives you an idea of uh, some game theory stuff, and I will see you in a future video.